Okay everyone, so after having learnt regarding the podocytopathies which included the minimal change disease, the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and the membranous nephropathy, we are moving on to the next glomerular disorder, okay, which is a separate entity and what is that disorder that we are going to learn? It is membranoproliferative membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis okay which uh, is abbreviated as mpgn okay mpgn membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis okay this is again very important uh, topic for your exams and let me begin by telling you two other synonyms for this MPGN which you should know one is it is also referred to as mesangiocapillary mesangiocapillary glomerulonephritis mesangiocapillary glomerulonephritis also it is referred to as lobar glomerulonephritis you will find out in due course why these names, okay, MPGN, mesangiocapillary glomerulonephritis, lobar glomerulonephritis, okay. So, let us try to understand what this disorder is, okay, to begin with. See, like the other glomerular disorders, you know, this is also a immune mediated glomerulonephritis. Now, talking about this disorder, the first point that you have got to know is that, See, it is a membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. So, which means one point is that there should be a glomerular basement membrane thickening. Okay. Glomerular basement membrane thickening because there is a membrano. Then there is a proliferation. So, proliferation in what? Is it the mesangial proliferation or is it an endocapillary proliferation? Well, it is mainly a mesangial proliferation with some degree of an endocapillary proliferation but predominantly remember this is a mesangial proliferation. This is a mesangial proliferation. Okay, mesangial proliferation. Okay, and another point that you have got to know is that remember it is also referred to as the mesangiocapillary glomerulonephritis and also referred to as the lobar glomerulonephritis. So understand one more point that the glomerular capillary tufts, okay, the glomerular capillary tufts in case of your MPGN will have a lobar architecture, okay, which is why uh, it is also referred to as a lobar glomerulonephritis, okay. So you will have a lobar glomerular tuft architecture okay we will come to that we will see the pictures everything will be clear but to begin with understand these points okay glomerular basement membrane thickening mesangial proliferation lobar glomerular architecture okay all right so these points you have understood now this mpgn membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis mpgn is again like other disorders primary as well as secondary okay primary as well as secondary but let me tell you one point that unlike the previous disorders that you saw that is your minimal change disease fsgs and membranous nephropathy this particular uh, mpgn you know this primary is actually very rare okay it is actually very rare okay you can get it but it is actually very rare primary mpgn most of the causes of MPGN are secondary, okay. Most of the causes of MPGN are secondary and it is very important to learn the secondary causes of MPGN because it is commonly asked in your exams. There are lots of infections associated with MPGN. You can have malignancies associated with MPGN. So in the exams, uh, you might be asked, even autoimmune diseases are there associated with MPGN. So, I will just show you the list of conditions associated with uh, secondary membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. 
First of all, I told you this can be associated with infection. Very important hepatitis B as well as hepatitis C. You can have uh, abscesses, okay, infective endocarditis, shunt nephritis, and quartan malaria, which is caused by your plasmodium malariae, okay. And then you can have schistosoma, nephropathy, mycoplasma infections. Some of the infections we have seen associated with other glomerular disorders as well. But always keep this in mind. The list of infections. And also you can have lots of rheumatological disorders associated. Which includes SLE, systemic sclerosis, Jogren syndrome, sarcoidosis. And very very important you can have an association with cryoglobulinemia. Okay, you already know that if you have listened to my rheumatology modules, the cryoglobulinemia and hepatitis C infection are very closely related. Okay, and then your anti-smooth muscle syndrome. These are the rheumatological disorders associated with secondary MPGM. Clear? Okay. Malignancies also may be associated. Carcinomas, lymphomas and leukemias associated with the secondary MPGN. And sometimes MPGN can be associated with inherited disorders. And the classical example is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. This is a very, very important point. May be asked as a question. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, secondary MPGN is associated. Clear? Okay. And also uh, the MPGN may be associated with a complement deficiency as well. Okay, so keep that also in your mind. It may be associated with complement deficiencies. So we have understood that uh, you have a primary MPGN which is very rare and a big list of causes for secondary MPGN. Very, very important. All right. So we have understood regarding the uh, primary MPGN and uh, secondary MPGN. Now, see, coming to the uh, classification, okay, the further classification of MPGN. Now see the, the classification of MPGN, you have two classifications. One is an old classification based on the ultra structure and also you have a new classification based on the pathology. Okay, so I'm going to brief you regarding both. Okay, so first is the classification based on the ultra structure. Okay, ultra structure and let's see how is MPGN classified. See, based on the ultra structure, MPGN is classified into three types. You can have a MPGN type 1, type 2 and type 3. Okay. Now, remember this is purely based on the uh, ultra structural changes that happen. See, in case of your MPGN type 1, okay, what happens is you will have the immune complex deposits. Okay, you will have the immune complex deposits predominantly in the subendothelium, subendothelial region, subendothelial and mesangial regions. Okay, you will have immune complex deposits in subendothelial and mesangial regions in case of MPGN type 1. When it comes to type 2, you are having predominantly, yes, you have mesangial, okay, you have mesangial deposits, but you will have mesangial as well as intramembranous deposits, mesangial as well as intramembranous deposits of the immune complexes, okay, that is type 2. Whereas it, when it comes to type 3, you will have predominantly subepithelial immune complex deposits, subepithelial that is most important okay subepithelial but in addition to that you may also have intramembranous intramembranous as well as subendothelial but predominantly it is a subepithelial okay predominantly it is a subepithelial deposit okay so that you have got to know and this was the old classification type 1 type 2 type 3 Okay. Now, after this classification, uh, as another classification came. Okay. And this classification is actually based on pathology. Okay. 
and uh, this classification is referred to as the Mayo classification the Mayo classification okay so how is the Mayo classification remember the Mayo classification divides it into two types okay only two types and uh, you can call it a type 1 and type 2 okay the type 1 as per the pathology is predominantly a immune complex mediated disorder okay immune complex mediated and it is having a plus or minus complement deposition okay this immune complex mediated but it may have some complement deposition okay that is very very important okay by which i mean type 1 means it's immune complex sometimes you can have a classical complement uh, pathway being involved and sometimes you can have a complement deposition okay but it is not a necessity for this type 1 type 2 is actually predominantly a complement mediated one and uh, please understand that okay this complement mediated pathway it is actually an alternate pathway of complement activation okay it is not the classical pathway uh, it is the alternate pathway of complement cascade that is involved i am sure you know the classical and complement pathways from your microbiology and pathology lessons so this is actually an alternate pathway and will it have the immune complex deposits you may have scanty immune complex deposits okay scanty immune complex deposits okay so this is type 1 and type 2 okay so this type 2 okay since it is involving the uh, alternate complement pathway this is referred to as a c3 glomerulopathy c3 glomerulopathy okay c3 glomerulopathy okay very very important now the c3 glomerulopathy that is your type 2 is again divided into two okay the c3 glomerulopathy is divided into two that is in certain subtypes of c3 glomerulopathy you may have intramembranous deposits intramembranous deposits and that is referred to as the dense deposit disease dense deposit disease dense deposit disease and uh, if there is no intramembranous deposits okay if there are no intramembranous deposit it is also referred to as the c3 glomerulonephritis c3 glomerulonephritis so this is very important what is dense deposit disease and what is c3 glomerulonephritis now there is a likely chance that you might be confused with this term dense deposit disease why because in the previous classification the type 2 where you had the intramembranous deposits that is also referred to as the dense deposit disease okay so i'm throwing some confusion for you okay but don't be confused okay just understand that in dense deposit disease what they mean is that they are having some deposits in the membrane glomerular basement membrane you see here in type 2 also in the previous classification you are having intramembranous deposits correct no so here also in the type 2 the c3 glomerulopathy you can have a intramembranous deposits that is when it is called a dense deposit disease and if there is no intramembranous deposit that is the c3 glomerulonephritis okay so let me tell you this second classification which i have told you that is the new classification okay but uh, i'll just uh, uh, show you a flow chart of the new classification you see here when you have mpgn membrano proliferative glomerulonephritis okay by a light microscopy you first look whether there is a, in the immunofluorescence because when you go for a immuno, when you go for a biopsy immunofluorescence uh, when you look it you will find that, uh, that when there is an immune complex mediated glomerulonephritis, you will have IgG plus IgM deposition 
plus or minus C3. Okay, because I have already told you in the immune complex deposits is predominantly immune complex. You may or may not have a classical complement pathway activation and C3 deposition. Okay. And uh, see this immune complex mediated glomerulonephritis, it may be, may be some infection related, may be autoimmune related or it may be associated with the monoclonal antibodies also. Okay, so you have an infectious MPGN, autoimmune MPGN and uh, a monoclonal MPGN which are subtypes of your immune complex mediated MPGN. Clear. Now, you see if in the immunofluorescence, if you have predominantly C3 deposition, okay, you are having a C3 deposition predominantly and you see there is little or no immunoglobulin. You remember I told you there is very scarce immunoglobulin deposits in case of your type 2. So that is referred to as the C3 glomerulopathy and when you have C3 glomerulopathy, you can again divide it either when you have an intramembranous, the glomerular basement membrane deposits or without uh, uh, intramembranous glomerular basement membrane deposits. The first one is a dense deposit disease and the last one is a C3 glomerulonephritis. So tell me are you very clear with the new classification of your MPGN? Yes? Okay. So now let's move on to the clinical features of MPGN. Okay. Clinical features of MPGN. So clinical features of MPGN, remember when we discuss the podocytopathies, I just mentioned something categorically that they present with a nephrotic syndrome. But here let me tell you they can present in different ways. Okay, so they can present with a nephrotic syndrome. They can present with a nephrotic syndrome picture. They can present with a nephritic syndrome nephritic syndrome or sometimes you know you might have combinations like almost a nephrotic plus nephritic picture okay nephrotic plus nephritic picture then you may have a presentation of a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis rpgn okay and sometimes you may have a initial presentation as a cgn okay that is your chronic glomerulonephritis chronic glomerulonephritis okay so this can proceed on to a chronic kidney disease and end stage renal disease as well but uh, you keep in mind that uh, it can present in varied ways as nephrotic nephritic combinations rpgn as well as chronic glomerulonephritis so i hope it is very clear so when you go to the investigations, okay, investigations, definitely in addition to the standard investigations that we have learned in the nephrotic syndrome, okay, you should definitely go for biopsy in this case as well, okay, definitely you have got to go for a biopsy. And when you go for a biopsy, let's see what will the, what is this? What is this? This is going to be a light microscopy, light microscopy in case of your MPGN. So MPGN light microscopy will show that there is some uh, proliferation. I told you this is predominantly a mesangial proliferation. So it is predominantly a mesangial proliferation. And remember, I told you one more point. You may have some endocapillary proliferation. But the predominant point is the mesangial proliferation. Some endocapillary proliferation. Okay, some endocapillary proliferation. Okay, and then another very, very uh, important finding is that you will see that all these glomerular tufts are having a low bar architecture. Yes, so that also is a very important point of the low bar architecture of the glomerular tufts. Okay, low bar architecture of the glomerular tufts. So these are the findings that you will get in case of a light microscopy. All right. Now uh, you can go for immunofluorescence. Immunofluorescence, remember I have already told you, okay, light microscopy. Immunofluorescence, I have already told you. If it is the type 1, as per the latest classification, you will have what? You will have IgG, IgG and IgM deposits plus or minus C3 
whereas if it is type 2 what you are going to have is predominantly a C3 deposition okay so that is the, these are the immunofluorescence findings and when it comes to the electron microscopy electron microscopy uh, you might be able to demonstrate the finer details as well okay where all these immune complex deposits occur okay so I'll show you a, a simplistic diagram okay to explain to you what will an electron microscopy look like so this is just a diagram okay simplistic diagram and are you able to see my arrow where you have all these black deposits they are actually the immune complex deposits and will you agree with me that you have these immune complex deposits uh, into your membrane the glomerular basement membrane so will you also agree with me if I say that this uh, immune complex deposits is almost splitting the glomerular basement, me basement membrane okay so this particular GBM splitting that occurs okay this particular GBM splitting that occurs is referred to as the tram track appearance okay tram track appearance now this tram track appearance sometimes you will be able to demonstrate in a electron microscopy plus you will see that the glomerular basement membrane is appearing very thick as well even in the light microscopy you will be able to say that there is some thickening okay but here you know you will be able to conclusively say that there is a significant thickening of your glomerular basement membrane as well okay so you can see all these deposits okay the the intramembranous deposits in case you have some uh, say sub endothelial deposits or even if you have here are you able to see some black deposits in the mesangium so you can have some mesangial deposits all you can appreciate in the electron microscope okay so that is again a very important part of the uh, investigation workup of uh, MPGN and always remember look out for secondary causes goes without saying okay MPGN always you have got to look out for the secondary causes because primary is very very rare now finally coming to the uh, treatment of MPGN treatment of MPGN see I told you primary MPGN is very rare but if at all it is a primary MPGN you can go for steroids okay and uh, secondary MPGN you have got to manage the underlying cause okay so you treat the underlying cause maybe it might be a hepatitis C and you might have an associated cryoglobulinemia so treating the underlying cause is very very important in case of secondary MPGN and whether it be primary or secondary MPGN you can also go for the AC inhibitors AC inhibitors or the ARBs which will block your renin angiotensin aldosterone system and uh, subsequently retard the proteinuria as well so that can also be used AC inhibitors and ARBs so that is it in summary about MPGN so it's uh, unlike the previous three disorders which were podocytopathies this is a standalone disorder and again this is one disorder where you have a, a, a possibility of getting questions because you have a good integration of medicine as well as pathology here okay so they may give you a pathological picture either maybe a simplistic diagram or maybe some light microscopy or electron microscopy picture as well but uh, in most scenarios the clinical presentation the underlying disorder plus you know the the, the way in which it presents I told you nephrotic nephritic combination so everything will actually give you a clue that this is likely to be a MPGN so very very important topic okay